Okay, let's get started. So the videos you're seeing on the screen right now are video recordings of microbes swimming around in a volume of water. Um, I forget what the exact sample chamber size is because I'm a bit of software guy, but um, it's basically bacteria and different, different species and such just swimming around. Um, Microscope being used is called a digital holographic microscope, which is interesting in that it captures three-dimensional uh, movement data or three-dimensional data in a two-dimensional frame. Um, it encodes the depth information in Fourier space, which is really cool. Um, it has to do with kind of a, almost works like LIGO kind of um, in that it uses the interference between two lasers to uh, kind of encode where the uh, where each particle is vertically, um, and therefore we can retrieve depth information um, in addition to x and y information. So for a mission to, a potential mission to Europa or Enceladus, which are ocean worlds, these are moons of Saturn and Jupiter that are covered in water. And for all we know, life depends on the existence of water to exist and so forth. In designing such a mission, um, it's of interest to include an instrument like this see if there's anything swimming around in there, right? Because motility is what we call it. Motility is one of the strongest life signatures we have. It's the self-propelled motion of some life to find food, to compete with each other, to explore, um, etc. So um, the, there's a project at JPL to develop such an instrument and to develop the processing algorithms for such an instrument because uh, a instrument like this records terabytes of video um, within no, no, uh, uh, within a couple um, observations. We have gigabytes and terabytes, and because of the um, inverse, uh, I guess the the bandwidth is constrained by distance squared. When we're as far out as Saturn and Jupiter, there's not that much bandwidth. Uh, we can't download as much data, so it's infeasible to download video from the potential missions. And so all we can do is do processing on board to find and track these particles and send down just the tracks and just some snippets of the video to show the scientists that we found something up there that's moving and uh, squirming alive. So this is your project one. <laughs> so your project one is called Motility Biosignature Classification. So what we've done for you is we've taken these videos and we've tracked these particles already. So now we have the X, Y, and time locations for each of these particles. Your job is to develop a classifier that will determine if each track, if each particle track exhibits motility, if it looks alive, if it's moving around and looking for food and reacting to stimuli, etc. Um, at face value, this seems fairly easy because as you saw in that video, our human brains are very, very good at identifying if something looks alive or not because it's very important for our own, for our own survival, right? Um, and so through millennia of evolution, our brains have gotten pretty good at this. But when you try to quantify it, when you try to get a computer to do it, it actually does get quite challenging. So um, let's see here. So this is your mini project. Um, we've, so we also have Piazza post, right? And we have the actual PDF. The PDF provides additional information on where the data comes from, um, details about the competition, where you submit, the Cavill invite link for joining the competition, um, and you know, it, it has a lot of resource to, resources to get you started. The first thing that we did do, First thing that we did do is we took those tracks, those x, y, t coordinates, and we've extracted some basic features for you already. So if you want, you could just go into the data, <clears throat> pull up the features. Oh, where's the trading set? There we go. Pull up the features CSV, and it has a unique ID for each track. It has the label as a binary: zero is non-modal, one is modal, um, and then it has some features already implemented for you, and I've described those in the PDF, and then there's also a Jupyter notebook that I uploaded to 
show you how I generated those features. So you can actually go in the code and see how did you calculate the average speed or how did I calculate the standard deviation of the percepts, et cetera. You are very much encouraged to develop your own features. In fact, I've intentionally omitted several very useful features because the project was too easy <laughs> with, with those uh, columns included. And so because this project allows for teams of up to four members, I think it's probably a good idea to assign some students to developing features, assign some students to developing the methods or the models, et cetera, or whatever split you see fit. But I think there's enough work here for a whole group of four to genuinely contribute to the project and try out some interesting things. Um, so you can download this Jupyter Notebook. This is sample code. You can modify it. I actually made it so that if you implement your own feature functions, it'll just generate the features for you. You don't have to mess with CSVs and all that. It doesn't use pandas at all, because I don't use pandas. Um, you know, so, so feel free to use this. And also, Kaggle provides a collab-like environment. In fact, it's owned by Google, so I think it's the same back end. But you can actually run notebooks on Kaggle, generate your submission, like final prediction, on Kaggle and submit it. So you don't even have to go back and forth between collab and such if you don't want to. You can also get GPUs on this and, and everything else. Well. So, anyway, so that's the features. So we pro we provide the features, and then in addition, in addition, we actually provide the tracks themselves as well. Data, let's go down. So we have the basic features, and then we have the original tracks. So if we go here. Train.json. We also provide these as CSVs if you prefer to work that way. We have a different CSV per track. And then here, you know, we have per track, we have the TXY coordinates, so time, and then the XY coordinates of the tracks themselves. So if you want to try an RNN, and I haven't tried an RNN on this, I don't actually know if that works, but you could theoretically run an RNN directly on the coordinates instead of extracting any features. Um, or you can use the provided notebooks to extract your own features from these coordinates. Okay, all right, so that's the project. It's really fun. Um, we're writing a paper on this right now, so if you do incredibly well, who knows? Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> very unlikely. Um, <laughs> well, so that's not because of anything. It's because the project that we're working on has to run these models on the spacecraft itself, right? So we're limited to decision trees, SVNs, fairly simple models like that. Um, the computer that we're targeting is like a RAD 750, which is the equivalent of an Apple II CPU, from like the Apple II, right? Like from the OG, like Steve Jobs uh, days, right? Um, so we can't use any of the advanced methods, but you could, and you can see how well it does. Um, oh, one more thing. Um, so we've also included in the training set both data actually collected from microscopy videos, so from, from the actual microscope, as well as simulated data from a simulator that we wrote to generate kind of reasonable data um, to, to uh, kind of mimic the behavior of modal and non-modal particles using subotic or regressive, using some methods. But the test set on which you will be competing on, there is a competition, there's a leaderboard. If you haven't done cattle before, there's a ranking. You submit your results, we rank you. First place gets like t-shirts or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> And extra credit, there's extra credit for like the top 50% or something like that. Um, the test set on which you'll be competing only contains microscopy, actual real data. So your training set combines real data and simulated data, and your test set only includes lab data. This is a very common setup in scientific applications where it's expensive to hire a microbiologist to sit there with a the microscope, feed in samples, there's all kinds of instruments, you have to develop the instrument, et cetera. So it's expensive to collect real data so instead, we generate some. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm just going to turn off my notifications. Um, it's expensive to collect real data, so we write a simulator to generate simulated data because that's easier for us. So you have to decide if you want to use the simulated data at all, and you'll know that it's a simulated data because the track UID starts with sim instead of lab. I'm going to keep scrolling here, but yeah, there we go. So anything starting with sim is simulated. And then anything starting with lab is real data. So you might want to weigh the lab data more. You might want to not use the simulated data at all. I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to this. Um, so that's kind of part of your research. And then finally, the evaluation. So you, we've been using loss and accuracy so far for 
kind of evaluating how well our models do on the data set. For, for this problem, we're going to be using something called F2 score. So F2 score is a ratio of precision and recall. I don't know how we haven't covered recall and precision yet. I mean, we really should have. Um, but essentially, recall is how much of the true, okay, there's a positive and a negative example, right? So there's ones and zeros. Recall is how much of the positive examples we found. And precision is, um, there's not like an intuitive way. Recall basically is high when you have a lot of true positives and not a lot of false negatives, right? So high recall means you found all the ones that you were supposed to find. Precision is highest when you don't have a lot of false positives, right? So I could predict one on everything and have perfect recall but awful precision, right? Because you don't have any false negatives but you have a lot of um, false positives. Does that make sense? Okay. If I have time at the end, I will actually write out the equations for precision and recall. But anyways, precision and recall is really important when we don't have a lot of positive signals, right? If you have like five ones and a hundred zeros, if I predict zeros on everything, you'll have like 95% accuracy, right? But that doesn't mean anything because we didn't actually find the ones that we were looking for. F2 score emphasizes recall. So imagine that we're on a mission to install for Europa. If there's a modal biosignature, we really don't want to miss it, right? So we can't have that many false negatives. But if we spuriously find, you know, if we spuriously analyze some non-modal tracks as modal tracks, not a big deal, right? We just lose a little bit of bandwidth, but no harm done, you know, we don't lose any science, right? But if we lose a track that is modal, but we, the algorithm says it's not modal, that's a bigger penalty than the other way around. Right? That's the intent. So we're doing F2 evaluation metric. I want to be, I want you to, I'm now remembering that I think we included that as an extra credit question on the, uh, uh, project report, so I guess free extra credit if uh, you're watching the lecture. Anyways, all right. <laughs> so that's the project. I won't go on too much about it because the rest is in the catalog and in the PDF. Um, uh, remember, in the points lineup, 10 points is for submitting something on the catalog that's like reasonable. We have a TA benchmark. You're not required to beat it, but 10 points just for catalog participation. 90 points is on your report, right? You're going to write up a research report explaining all the things you tried, explaining all the decisions that you made. That's the real important part, and we're gonna be reading your collab notebooks, we're gonna be looking for plots, we're gonna be looking for the way you plotted your data and the way you designed other features, and et cetera. So that's, that's the really important part. So just don't rush your report, because because the capital is due on one day, and then the report is due on the next, and I know everyone's gonna work like crazy on the code and then not start to report until the day of the deadline. Please don't do that, <laughs> right? Um, we're going to report throughout, keep a research notebook, you know, pretend this is like research practice a little bit, right? Um, keep notes, um, and uh, at the end, you'll save yourself a lot of work if you have like half the report done, even by the at, by end of the capital deadline. Okay, so the capital is due next week at 5 p.m., and then the report is due at 9 p.m. the day after. So giving you a little bit of a buffer there. Okay, everything else is on the, uh, on the website, on the PSA. Uh, any questions? on the project. Okay, cool, I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, before it was like a lone data set, so I didn't really like it, because I don't like to finance data sets. It was weird. Predictive this person will default on their loans and ruin their personal finance. Um, but this is like, you know, this is science. So this is, and this is a project that I've been working on for about two years now. Um, so this is pretty exciting to be able to share my work as well. So let me know if you have any questions. Okay. You're also gonna be a piece of No. So just one week, just this project. We'll go back to a piece set after that, and then there'll be like a project to, yeah. So it's one week project, and then piece set after. So yeah, we had a little bit of overlap in the old schedule, but we managed to stretch it out, so there's no overlap anymore. Okay, cool. All right, let's go over to the lecture. Do I have anything else I wanted to share here? Uh, no, I guess not. Oh, one, one more thing. There's just so much. I do a lot of work on this. Um, I also have a track visualization example so that you can actually see what some of these tracks look like. You can look at this example. Um, again, motility looks a little squiggly. Non-motility looks like a straight line. You would think that that's easy to do, but wait till you start working on it. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, so back to the lecture.
And the reason I spent so much time on this is because uh, today's lecture is a little short, um, so we have some extra time to uh, do this. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. So today's lecture is on clustering and dimensionality reduction. Uh, I have this slide that I didn't use at all, but that's a quick summary of everything I've talked about so far. Um, okay, so in the past few weeks, with Dr. Rebecca Pregada's half of the course, as well as the first deep learning course, uh, a couple lectures that I talked about, um, we've been talking about supervised learning. And just as a quick reminder, supervised learning just means you have data and you have labels and you're trying to go from the data to the labels. Or not even that, like you just have some kind of external annotations for a task that you're trying to perform. That's, that broadly falls under the category of supervised learning. And within this topic, we've talked about linear models, some overfitting, loss functions. Um, so we've talked about nonlinear models, learning algorithms and optimization, and then you know, we'll do a little bit more probability modeling, but we've mentioned that briefly. So supervised learning is certainly, I guess, uh, uh, Professor Yisong kind of referred it to as the workhorse of machine learning, right? In most practical senses where you're trying to train and deploy something to do or automate or you know, improve some process, it's probably gonna be supervised learning, right? But supervised learning is expensive, right? And that's because of those annotations, those labels. Um, it's always difficult to not only get data that's clean and structured, that just data collection in and of itself is such a hard problem in itself, but then to have some humans sit there and label this data. And I'm sure you're, you've heard of all these different startups in uh, San Francisco Bay Area companies and Amazon Mechanical Turk. You've, you've seen ads for this surely as like CS majors slash students in, in interested in AI. I get these ads all the time on Facebook or Instagram or wherever I go, they just follow me around, right? Where they offer to label your data for cheap. And that's because it's a hard problem, right? Um, so the other aspect of machine learning that we'll now talk about is called unsupervised learning. Um, so unsupervised learning is trying to do machine learning without labels. And we do this by extracting hidden structures. And when I say hidden, I don't mean like Sherlock Holmes, you know, like it's not, no one's obscuring it. It's just that the data is so complex that it's not easy for us to draw out the structures in the data just by looking at it, right? We need these additional algorithms and these additional methods to derive out the structure, the hierarchy, the patterns in the data. And then from that, it creates some sort of uh, framework in which we're able to do the machine learning task or do analysis on that data, right? So, so in, in a sense, without manually labeling the data, without providing annotations, without pro providing the truth, we're instead implying what that is through the structures and patterns embedded in the data itself. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what the intent of, of unsupervised learning is. Note that this is different from self-supervised learning or um, kind of deep learning, unsupervised learning. It tends to kind of take this in different directions as well, so don't get confused by that. We're just talking about machine learning, unsupervised learning here. Deep learning kind of likes to eat things up and reinterpret them and use them for its own, for own, own purpose. So just straight unsupervised learning. So today we're just gonna talk about clustering and dimensionality reduction. Um, you may be familiar with some of these topics already, especially if you've taken the Linalge course we should know about matrix factorization and PCA and SVM. But we're just gonna look at those from the perspective of machine learning and see you know, what machine learning really uses that for, right? Um, and then clustering um, is one of those things where conceptually it's pretty easy to understand, um, but when we talk about it algorithmically, it gets pretty interesting. And clustering is a very interesting field, especially when you kind of get into the theory of it. Um, uh, this, it seems simple at face value, but it can get very complex and very theoretical, um, very interesting, um, if you, the more and more you look into it. So, okay, so let's talk about clustering. So clustering is exactly what it sounds like. Clustering is the process of grouping data points into clusters, where we're just grouping things. And again, humans are really good at this because through evolution, it seems that clustering things into groups is uh, beneficial to our own survival, right? It's, is that group of leaves a tree? Like, right, like we're very good at looking at things and grouping them. Um, 
to a fault sometimes if you take some sociology and psychology courses uh, like in group app group stuff, right? Um, so clustering, we're just take, taking our data and we're saying, can we group these into categories? Now, talking about this a little bit more specifically, and we're, just, we're starting to try to define what a group is and what a cluster is, right? So the qualities of a cluster that we want is that within each cluster, intro cluster, we want high similarity by whichever metric we define similarity, right? And then between clusters, so inter clusters, we want low similarity in general, again, in whatever similarity space that we've defined. And sure, there's like five million different ways to define what similarity is, right? Um, but in general, this is what we're going for. So one such example is this example. And by the way, when we talk about clustering, I'm gonna be showing examples in two dimensions and it looks really easy because it's in two dimensions. But every time, kind of think that, okay, how would I do this in a thousand dimensions, right? can't visualize it, so it's a little hard, but kind of, you know, the examples look very simple in two dimensions, but that's because it is. Okay. So, we have this uh, data. How many clusters would you say is in this data? Three, right? Okay, so we're very good at this, again, like I said. Um, but that's, that's the goal, you know. Uh, look at this data, convert it to something that's interpretable. And then now, you know, now that we know that there are three clusters, we can make some assumptions about the data. Right? So we can assume that all the data points in each cluster are similar. So this creates almost like a kind of summary for us. So in, previously, if we had to understand this data, I might have had to look at every single data point, right? But now, if I just take one sample from each cluster, I might think that, okay, I have a pretty good sampling of the data set, right? So instead, like maybe if I said I randomly sampled three points, like uniform randomly sampled three points from this data set, I might have sampled three points from the same cluster, and I wouldn't have a good representation of the data set, right? But now that we have this cluster, we can sample one point from each, and now I have a, now I can be fairly confident that I have a good sampling of the data set, right? So that's kind of the intent of, of why we're doing clustering and why we're doing this. Okay, let's formalize this even further. So given some unlabeled data, again, no labels, labels are banned for this particular uh, lecture. Um, the goal is to find hidden structures, um, for example, well, in, I've harped on this enough. Um, the, another interpretation of this is a, gener, a generative model of data with some uh, probability. Uh, we're gonna talk about probabilistic model, uh, methods in further lectures, so kind of bank that for now and we'll talk about it more. Um, but in a sense, we're trying to generate some low dimensional summary of the data. And not dimensional in the X and Y sense, but dimensional in the sense of uh, belonging to a cluster. Or let's say we had X and Y, so it's two-dimensional data, now we have one-dimensional, is it in this cluster or not? Right. Okay. Any questions up till now? A very basic definition of clustering. Okay, cool. All right, so why is clustering useful? So as I mentioned before, clustering itself is a summary of data. Um, this is a really good example. I, I've seen this uh, example quite a few times. But if I search Google images for the word Pluto, this is kind of all the different images that come up. But you can use the methodology that this paper used to group these images into clusters by row, right? So the first row, I think, is, is that Mount Wilson? That might be Mount Wilson Observatory. No, no, never mind, never mind. Anyways, it's some, it's some observatory, there's a Pluto walk. Second, I think there's, looks like a furniture design thing. And then the third is like the actual dwarf planet, right? Um, and then there's some TV show that was like really old called Pluto. And then we have the dog Pluto. And then we have some artists, looks like, right? But, but the point is, even within this one seemingly homogenous category, Pluto, there's all these different clusters, right? And so if we run a clustering algorithm like this on images, we can quickly see what kind of subsets there are um, within this data. And we can kind of assume that these examples shown are representative of everything else that is kind of similar um, to, to each cluster as well. So that's pretty cool. And then the next thing that clustering is useful for is pre-processing before supervised training. So again, because we can kind of interpret this as a dimensionality reduction step, we can do clustering before we do any kind of supervised learning uh, because it'll make the problem simpler for the model that we're using. And for neural networks and such, it doesn't really that make that much sense because neural networks are such high capacity, but for certain tasks where you know, we're going into tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dimensions, um, this might be something that you have to do, right? 
Um, also for labeling, right? It might help to pre-cluster your data before you start labeling, right? So instead of having the labeler go through line by line um, and say, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a horse or whatever, we can show them an entire cluster and go, what are these? And then they can go, these, these are all the horses, right? And then that's just one labeling step instead of going uh, data by data. So um, it can be useful for supervised learning down the line as well. Okay, so let's talk about one method of clustering. And this is called k-means. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, and this is probably the most naive way of doing clustering, which is why it's also commonly called naive k-means clustering. Um, so that's, that's, that's what this means uh, when we're talking about. So given some data set here, um, so again, our data set is conveniently clustered into three for the uh, sake of example. But given some data set, what we're going to do first is we're going to take these data sets and we're going to randomly assign them to k clusters. So in this case, we're going to pick k equals three. Obviously, picking the correct k is a whole other subject on itself, right? How many clusters? Should we cluster into? But let's assume that we somehow, some oracle told us that three is the right number to use here. Okay, so we're doing, we're setting k equals three. And so we're going to randomly assign all the data set, all the data points, into three buckets, right? Into three categories. And we're just going to label them randomly. So that's the first step. So now we have these random points with random labels. And then for each category, so for each cluster that we've labeled, so for all the red data points here, we're going to take the mean. So we're going to take, hence the name, k-means, right? We're going to take the mean of that, uh, of, of that data set and assign that as the center of that cluster, okay? And we're going to do that for black and we're going to do that for purple as well. So now we have three clusters that were randomly labeled and then we have the means of those random cluster assignments, right? The next step, we're going to look at each of those means and then we're going to look at the data points that are closest to those means. So before we assigned the data points to clusters, and then we calculated the mean. Now we're going to fix the means, and we're going to reassign the data points to those means. Okay? So you can see here, we had this before. We, we calculated our mean averages, our cluster centers, and then we assign new data points. We reassign all the data points to their nearest center. Okay. And then after we do that, we then recalculate the mean again from these new, new assignments. So then the means move a little bit. Okay. And then we go back again, we go back and we reassign the nearest points to their respective means. And then we do that again and the means shift a little. So uh, we, we recalculate the mean center and then we reassign, recalculate, reassign, recalculate, reassign until eventually, when you do this update, nothing changes. We've converged, right? We've converged on the mean center, the mean center doesn't move anymore, and new points don't, don't get assigned to each cluster center. Okay, so to formalize this objective, ooh, maybe the laser will work. No, never mind, I'm doing the screen. Um, <laughs> to formalize this uh, objective, we have this set here, so S is our full set of all the data points, and we're seeking to minimize, we're, we're, we're seeking some parameters that minimize, right? The distance between each data point and its assigned cluster center, right? So that we're using the L2 norm here, that's what the two vertical bars with the two on top means. So L2 distance, just the distance between two points, um, the Euclidean distance between two points. We're trying to minimize the Euclidean distance of each of each point from its assigned cluster center, right? And then so uh, small c is the cluster center itself because we're all, we're optimizing the location of the centers themselves, right? But then we also have big C, which is the uh, the membership of each point to each cluster center. So we're trying to find both the ideal cluster centers as well as the ideal memberships of the points to those cluster centers that minimizes overall distance of each data point to its assigned cluster average, uh, cluster center. Does that make sense? Does that first equation make sense? Any questions about that first equation? We're just formalizing here. We're not, we're not actually going to go anywhere with this. We're just formalizing it mathematically. Okay. And then the next, the next uh, equation I have, we have below it 
is, so we can actually show that for any given cluster set, the cluster center that minimizes this loss, right, this Euclidean distance, is actually the cluster mate. You can prove that, right? And so if we can, if we can assume that the cluster centers will always be the mean of each cluster membership, if we can define, if we can define small c by their big C always, right? Then we can actually redefine this as the variance, right? So we have the um, cardinality of big C, right? So that's a number of L, uh, number of data points that are in the cluster set, and then we have the variance, which is just the difference between each data point and its mean. Right? So we're just redefining, we're just taking advantage of the fact that the cluster center is always going to be the mean of its cluster set, and then we're redefining the Euclidean distance as the variance because it's the same thing. Okay? Does that also make sense? Okay. So then the logical explanation after that is that we're just finding uh, the cluster. Uh, memberships that minimizes the variance within each cluster, okay? and that that makes a lot more sense as well. If you're kind of into the variance distribution mindset, that might make a lot more sense than just uh, minimizing uh, individual Euclidean distances. Okay, so we're trying to find the clustering that minimizes the variance for a cluster. <clears throat> so let's formalize then the algorithm that we just demonstrated to find these, to iteratively find these cluster memberships, uh, these cluster sets and these cluster centers. So we have, so we call this the EM algorithm, we call this the expectation maximization algorithm. This is a very common paradigm for unsupervised learning. Uh, this happens, you will see this everywhere. You will see this kind of setup for different unsupervised problems uh, very often uh, because this is how you converge, right? This, you don't really get a gradient, right? So instead, you iterate between these two steps um, to converge. Um, so first, we have the, the expectation step. So we're, we're estimating big C given some initial state, right? Um, so we estimate cluster membership. Initially, we did this randomly, right? We randomly assigned data points to clusters, right? And then the maximization is when we're estimating the cluster center, so the small c. And we do that by just taking the mean, right? And that's the actual model parameter, right? So the, mod the clustering model itself is defined by the location of the centers. We can just derive out the cluster memberships by you know, finding which points is the closest to each center. And we just iterate back and forth between the two um, while we do that. The maximization step is called maximization because this Paradigm originally existed for probabilistic models, and so typically what people were trying to do is maximizing the minimum log likelihood. So if you have some probabilistic model, you're trying to maximize the likelihood of that model given some conditional probability, right? Um, but you, know, you don't have to worry about that for now. Again, we'll cover uh, prob uh, probabilistic models later on in the course. Uh, but just know that this ENM is very common, and we're just stepping back and forth between, um, again, estimating some cluster membership, updating our model parameters based on those membership, and then updating our memberships, uh, updating our cluster memberships based on those new parameters, back and forth, back and forth, until we converge. Okay? All right. Oh, these slides are really useful. Okay, again, <laughs> real quick. Patient step, assign the clusters um, to their smallest distance to C, assign the cluster memberships, and then based on those cl uh, cluster memberships, we compute the parameters. Yeah, that's how you initialize the algorithm. Initialize Just, randomly. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, you could also randomly assign cluster centers, but I think that takes a lot longer to converge just because you don't know what the possible space is, really, to set the centers, right? But theoretically, you could start by randomly setting the center somewhere and then going forward from there. Um, yeah. So, is this required that you know the exact number of clusters that will be? Yes. Um, so what what will happen a lot of times? I don't, I don't think we cover this later. Anyways, um, what will happen a lot of times is you'll just run clustering with different values of k, and then pick the one that minimizes the variance globally, right? Um, for for naive k-means, obviously you can also use not k-means, right? And that might be the better solution um, if you don't know how many clusters you need. But that is one strategy: is to sweep some k value and then do it. Um, the difficulty with that too is the complexity. Um, this is 
fairly expensive, especially if, if you have a massive data set, because you're measuring a lot of Euclidean distances. So it's like big O of n k r something, like it's four different variables multiplied, because it's like your dimensionality, how many data points do you have, how many clusters do you have, and how many iterations are you doing. It's all of those multiplied into big O. So it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. Good question. Um, okay. So this is more of the same thing. I'm, I've kind of front-loaded the explanation here, but so this is the same thing. Yeah. Is this always converting to one? No. So depending on your initial randomness, uh, it can converge to certain local minima and it can get suck. Um, sometimes it's not even clear that there is a global minima, so it just arrives at different answers depending on your different initialization. Again, what you do is you run it 10 times and then you pick the most common one or uh, you pick the best one that minimizes the global variance. Yeah. Good question. Um, okay. Uh, let me see if I missed anything at this interpretation slide. Okay, you get it, right? Uh, we're trying to summarize data about cluster membership. This cluster membership tells you some structure, and then um, kind of intuitively, we're trying to minimize the amount of variance in each cluster, right? Okay, so k-means, sometimes it's referred to as centroid-based clustering, because the mean of a collection of points is the centroid, like geometrically, right? If you want a geometrical interpretation, instead of a probabilistic word distribution. Um, <laughs> so it's, all, it's also called central-based clustering. Um, yeah, so it defines clusters using a notion of centrality. I prefer distance metric, right, or using L2, L1, some other cosine similarity, right? There's all these different kind of distance metrics you can use to define what the center means or what the mean average means, right? Um, so we use, we, in order to solve this, in order to uh, converge our clustering, we use the EM algorithm. Here's a probabilistic variant. Um, you might be familiar with Gaussian mixture models. I don't know if we cover GMMs in this, but GMMs are also very popular. So if we don't mention Gaussian mixture models, definitely look that up afterwards. Um, and then again, it's very useful when the centrality assumption is good. So it's, it's very good when similar things are similar. It, it, by your definition of what similarity is, if the center is a good representation of that cluster, then this is good. But there's like certain cases, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but you can imagine some cluster where it looks like this. Right? Then K means is not going to work, right? Because the center of this is like here. And then the center of this, to our visual mind, is like over here. But then if you do K means, right, you can see this is going to take up like this. And then this is going to cluster, I don't know. Like this, right? Anyways, so you can see how this can possibly break down for more complex kind of scenarios where the centrality assumption falls apart. Right? Okay. Any other questions about naive k means? No? Cool. All right. So, on kind of on this note, as a thought experiment, in this case, what is good, good clustering? So, there's two options here. There's like the clustering defined by the black circles, and then there is the clustering defined by the orange circles, right? So in a lot of cases like these, there isn't one clear answer for what the correct clustering is, right? Because there, it might be a task where we care about those individual clusters, and it might be a task where we care just about those big clusters overall. So instead of trying to answer that question up front with the kind of method that you choose, or by choosing K, what we can do instead is called hierarchical clustering. So k-means use the centroid structure where we said that you know, closeness is what we're interested in, similarity is what we're interested in. Sometimes we want something like a linkage structure or a graph, right? Sometimes we just want a graph. Um, you'll hear that a lot in computer science. It'd this be a lot easier if we just represent this as a graph. So if we employ hierarchical clustering, it's also called, uh, there's a like one example is agglomerative clustering, I pronounced that. Um, also linkage-based clustering because we're building links between um, data points. But the idea is, right, if, if we have a hierarchy of our data, we can decide where to cut, right? So at the lowest levels of the hierarchy, if you imagine a tree with all the data points at the bottom, and then some kind of binary tree structure going up to the top, right? If I cut it at the very top of this tree, then you have two clusters. 
And if you cut it near to the bottom of the tree, you'll get a lot of clusters, right? So this kind of gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of you know, how many clusters do I want, what are the relationships between clusters, what clusters are near each other. It adds this all, 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 types, of, all types of information that can be useful. So let's go through an example of agglomerative clustering. <clears throat> so we have some data points. And what we're going to start by doing is we're going to draw some links. We're going to draw edges, um, if you've taken like graph stuff. Uh, we're going to draw edges between the nearest points. Okay, so we're just going to go through. And, and there's, a, there's also a metric in terms of like choosing which ones we draw a link between. But it's usually like a threshold. So we're going to say, if there are two points that are nearer than five or something, we're going to iteratively go through and draw lines between them. And then after that, for each remaining nodes, we're going to take the nearest point. So we're going to take the nearest distances between points that are next to each other and then draw the lines between those as well. Okay. And we're just going to keep doing that. So for each data point, we say, what's the nearest point? And if that's already in the cluster, that's OK. We just keep drawing these edges. But note that we're keeping track of which edges we drew first. So not, or, not only are the locations of the edges important, but also the order in which the edges are drawn are, is also important. Okay? Now we keep doing that, keep doing that, until we've, def we've covered the entire data set. Okay? So all the edges connect all the subgraphs single connected component, right? Um, does this seem like something else to anyone else? Any similarities to existing algorithms or existing data structures? No? Okay, so this is just finding the minimum spanning tree. Um, if you've taken like CS3 or something like that. Um, it's just for skulls algorithm, right? So that's, that's where we say you know, we're trying to build a binary tree. Um, of some graph, right? We're trying to build it. The, actually, the minimum spanning tree, I should say. Um, and so we employ Kruskal's algorithm. But again, the, the, the key point here is we don't care just about the graph structure, but also the order in which the graph was drawn, right? So that we can say uh, this, is a, this is a cluster that incorporates smaller clusters within it, um, et cetera. Okay. So again, depending on which level, we stop at. If we stop here, we get two clusters. If we stop here, we get three. If we stop here, we get four, et cetera. Right? So that's, that's where the usefulness of hierarchical clustering comes in. And then, yeah, also to point out that uh, right, the order matters. And then this is also equivalent to finding a binary tree partitioning with progressively smaller partition distances. Um, again, if you're kind of in that space and that language familiar to. Um, also worth noting that this is um, big O E log E, where E is the number of edges, the algorithm, cruise calls, I mean. So it's a lot more um, computationally efficient than um, naive K, right? Uh, there's still the cost of calculating Euclidean distances because you need to check what's nearest to everything, but building the tree itself is uh, E log E where E is the number of edges. Um, naive k-means is like O of, like I said, four different uh, parameters added together, or multiplied together, so it's very uh, expensive. Uh, naive k-means is also NP-hard. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it, it's not, a, you, you won't see that being used a lot for massive data sets or, or anything like that. Um, actually, there's a lot of interesting naive, uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting NP-hard, kind of, you know how like when you do NP-hard analysis, you, prove that one problem is NP-hard because it can be like converted into another NP-hard problem. Like one of those can be like naive, not, uh, naive uh, I'm sorry, um, k-means clustering. So that's kind of, it's fun. I'll look it up. You'll see some interesting CS theory stuff in there. All right, so that's all we have for clustering. Um, so again, we've covered, we have time. Um, so we have, we've defined what unsupervised learning is. It's just learning without um, labeling. Covered k means, which is centroid based, which is that clusters, we assume clusters are clumped together around some central point. 
Uh, and then we covered linkage-based, which is that clusters can be organized hierarchically. It gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how many clusters we have. And then might, the hierarchy itself might tell us something about the data as well. Um, and then again, this works fantastic when clusters are the structure in your data that you're trying to find. Okay. Any other questions about clustering in general? We're going to move on to some other topic. Well, if you have time, I'll also mention there's other clustering methods based on other assumptions, right? So this is centroid. There's a centroid assumption, right, where we say centers is what's important. We have linkage-based assumptions, which is we say there's some hierarchical structure already. There's another methods that are like density-based. So for example, if you've heard of DD scan before, that's a very popular kind of method for clustering this type of. This no longer makes sense. Um, So for clustering this types of data, um, it's very popular because dbscan doesn't have a centroid assumption as a density assumption. So it assumes that points in a cluster are more densely packed together. So I don't want to draw a lot of points, but right, dbscan kind of does this thing where it starts at a point and it keeps jumping to points that are near, near to it, right? And the assumption is that if you keep doing that, eventually you'll reach the entire cluster by a chain, almost, jumping from point to point. It's obviously way more complex than that, but like the intuition is that uh, points in a cluster are near each other, so it'll stay in this structure, and then it won't jump to another cluster that's some gap away. Scan is a density-based uh, clustering method. Um, then, you know, uh, again, I'm talking about this in two dimensions because it's easy to illustrate. Imagine this in a thousand, right? And then it gets pretty complicated. A thousand dimensional space. Okay. All right. Cool. So, let's talk about what clustering doesn't work on. So, what if you have this? Um, you just have this one blob, this oblong blob of data. You can't cluster this. It's not going to tell you anything, right? It'll tell you you have one cluster. Not the same type, right? If you have two, it'll probably draw one on that side and one on that side. But again, that's wrong, right? There's no two clusters in this. There's no. There's not going to be a, a substantial enough difference between the two clusters to justify having two clusters. Um, so what we're going to talk about is instead called principal component analysis. <coughs> Before I get into PCA, I want to emphasize that PCA is not a machine learning method. PCA has like predated machine learning by decades, if not centuries, right? We've had this for a while. This is like core linear algebra concept. Um, so please, yeah, uh, don't get the wrong idea. Machine learning has this tendency, and it's funny because uh, Isan in his recording also mentioned this. Machine learning has this tendency to kind of eat everything. And kind of be like, oh, you're a machine that like, you've existed for 200 years. You're machine learning now. Congratulations, right? Um, or kind of data science is now doing the same thing to machine learning, which is pretty funny because machine learning has been doing it to other fields for a while now. Um, but uh, just have just know that this is like a really fundamental linear algebra concept, that it's not like a machine learning method, right? Not that it's not important. If anything, that makes it that makes it even more important. Um, but just just know that it's it's a linear algebra method. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> so. Instead of clustering, so instead of assigning um, membership to clusters, instead of grouping, instead of categorizing, maybe we want to describe the data in a way right, that maximizes our understanding of the data. If you know PC already, you kind of feel what I'm going. I'm, I'm trying to lead up to it. Okay. So when we summarize data, okay, so when we summarize data, we're generally trying to understand the data by looking at fewer attributes or fewer dimensions, right? So clustering, we did this by replacing each data point by membership, right? Instead of saying, you're XYZ IJK, you are a member of this cluster, right? That's how we're doing summarization. PCA instead the summarization via orthogonal projections by defining a new feature space via which we can interpret this data, right? And sometimes that means dimensionality reduction. You can certainly do dimensionality reduction with PCA, and we'll talk about that here. 
But even just doing PCA by itself kind of defines a new uh, feature space by which the data becomes more interpretable. And we'll go through some examples. Okay, so for this particular example, what we have is this blob, right? And so this blob, let's say, we don't have the axes here, but let's say these blobs are defined in x, y space, right? So when we look at these in x, y space, because this blob is kind of tilted to the side because it's diagonal, right? The variance in x is limited from here to here, right? And then the variance in y is limited from down here to there. And when I say variance, you can think of contrast almost, right? I'm just talking about the sheer absolute range of values that the data covers, okay? But what we, what we can do instead is we can, we, we can find a new axis so new axes, right? We can find a new space, a transformed space, on which we can project the data so that it has even more variance, even more contrast, even more um, expression over each of the individual axes, okay? So you can imagine on this, right? Before when we had the axes just up and across, the x-axis only covered this much variance. If we define the x-axis again on this tilted space, and we draw it like this, you can imagine it got longer, right? Um, the data covers a wider range. It's more expressed over, over the axis. So again, for this example, it's hard to see why that's important, because it's in two, two dimensions. But there are certain methods where it is, this is important, right? If we, want to, we want each axis, we want, axes is plural, we want each axis Right? to contain as much variance and therefore as much information as possible. Okay? And then it gets even more important once we get into uh, dimensional auto reduction. But anyways, so we can achieve this new feature representation. So we're drawing these lines and then we're rotating it so that it becomes our new x and y axis. That's PCA. Right? Okay, let's go into kind of the Linux part of this. Um, if you know PCA already from Linux, you probably know it as the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. Uh, we're going inverse. We're, we're going to start at what we want, and then we're going to go back up to the eigen decomposition, which is kind of interesting, because I always learned it kind of in the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix side. But this is kind of a machine learning oriented uh, slide, so we're having a new perspective. So I think you'll find this interesting. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. We'll, we'll get there. Um, so. We're going to define what an orthogonal matrix is. So an orthogonal matrix is some matrix U. Um, oh, there we go. So a matrix U is orthogonal if U times U transform, or U transform U, transpose, not transform. Uh, U, U times U transpose is the same as U transpose U, is the identity matrix, right? So by identity, I mean uh, a, matrix, a square matrix where there's ones all across the diagonal. This can be sparse, we don't want it to be sparse, but it could be sparse, right? So uh, ones or zeros along the diagonal, and then zeros everywhere else. Uh, that's what we're talking about. So orthogonal matrices have this property that for any column, so I try to do this without drawing the matrix, but. Anyways, right, so we have, this is u, right, so u transpose u times, uh, it equals some identity matrix, right? Um, and then for any column u, we just take one, so by definition, right, if we take any, so convenience here, right, if we take any column in this matrix u, and then multiply it by itself transpose, it's going to be one. Right, because of matrix multiplication, right? Because it multiplies, multiplies like this, right? Okay. Um, so for any two columns, u and u prime, that aren't equal, if you multiply them, it's zero because that's that's what fills up the rest of these spots in this uh, diagonal matrix or in this identity matrix. And so the kind of interpretation is, we're trying to find. PCA is trying to find some U, right? Because then U, we can treat U as a rotation matrix. 
So U is some matrix that's going to transpose the data into this new feature space. And then U transpose is actually the inverse rotation. It'll, re it'll uh, rotate it back into the original data form. Okay? So that's what we're trying to arrive at. That's what we're trying to produce with PCA. Um, so what we're trying to say, if, if X, X is the data point now, that's external to everything. If we multiply, if we multiply X by U transpose, right? We arrive at this new feature space. I'm gonna keep doing this, all right? So we have X, we multiply it by U, we end up here. U transpose, we end up here. And then we multiply that back by U, and then we end up back where we started, okay? All right, so that's what we're trying to arrive at. Other properties of orthogonal matrices that are important is that first, it's norm preserving. So what, what, that, what that means is that this feature, uh, this, this projection of this data point into the feature space, it maintains the norm. So it doesn't change the values themselves. Right? It doesn't change like the distances between points and things like that. It's, it's, it's norm preserving. Uh, mathematically, right? If you have x the projected, uh, the product of the projected data point by its transpose is the same as the uh, product of the original data point to its transpose. Right? So it's, it's norm preserving. So that's important for any kind of pre-processing uh, transformation we want to do for, to the data set. We don't want to change the data itself, okay? And then also, more importantly, um, it preserves total variance, right? So, so when, we, when, we're doing the, when we're drawing these lines, when we're drawing these axes, we're trying to maximize the variance expressed in each of the axes, but it doesn't change the overall variance of the data set, right? So the point we're trying to make is that this doesn't change qualities about the data set itself, it just re projects them into a space where they're easier to work with, okay? where, where um, the axes are more expressive. More expressive. This, does express, uh, does, this does assume a zero mean, and so we'll tend to subtract the mean from the data set when we do this. So for example, if we had, if we had this, right? If the axes were like here, we would subtract the mean so that the, axis, the zero, zero is in the middle here before we get this. All right, any questions about PCA so far? So we're, again, we're going a little bit backwards. So we're starting with what we want, which is we want to define some U matrix so that all of these qualities are satisfied. Okay, all right. So one of the motivations for doing PCA is dimensionality reduction. So one of the ways to reduce your dimensions is to just drop an axis, right? So if I have x, y, I could say, my model can't handle two dimensions, it can only handle one dimension. I'm just gonna use the x axis, right? That's, that's a decision I could make. So if we're gonna do that, again, it's of interest to have as much variance uh, covered by that axis as possible, which is why this comes in useful, right? In fact, we can, the concept is we can project all the data points onto a single axis to have a lower dimensionality re uh, representation of this data set. And PCA helps me pick, or helps me find, that axis by which it would be the best to describe the data set on, on just one, one axis. It helps me draw the best line, essentially. Okay. Um, so again, we have this data, we draw, the lines with, we draw the new lines with PCA, we take one column of the point. So we have, the U matrix, right? We have the full U matrix that we calculated. If we just take one column and then multiply it by the input data, we get this projection, right? Um, because of the way uh, that projection matrix works. If we were to multiply the entire U matrix by X, we would end up at this, right? But because we're only multiplying by a single column of U, we're projecting the data onto the space defined by that one U column, by that one column of the U matrix, right? So that's where we end up. And then we reproject it back, right? So remember how we talked about U is, U gets you here, and then or U transpose gets you here, and then U gets you back, right? If we try and get this back, we actually end up here, because in this process, we have lost the second dimension entirely, right? We have thrown away all information 
contained in this other axis by projecting the data into this new space and then projecting it back into its original space. So that's what we want. But the shape is the same, right? So kind of the direction of the axis we can recover. But we can never recover this axis again. Right? When we project it, and then we project it back. So We can actually do this with any arbitrary subset of columns. So we're starting with 300 dimensions, and then we only use three columns. We can project those 300 dimensional data point into a three dimensional data point, right? Or into a two dimensional data point, right? And then we can try to project it back, but we can't because we've lost those other dimensions, right? So we can start with 100 dimensional data, project it into two dimensional data, uh, data uh, two-dimensional space using this method by using two columns of the U, of the U matrix, right? And then that allows us to plot it. It's very uh, it's very useful for visualization. Uh, but then if you try to project it back, you will lose all the information that you lost by dropping those columns. Does that make sense? Any questions about this process? Okay. It's either confusion or clarity. Uh, I can't really tell which. But, um, We'll move on. Okay, so here's a formal definition of what PCA is accomplishing. We have some matrix M. I don't know why it says M. It's X here. M equals, all right. We're defining some matrix of all the data, X, capital X. And then we subtract the mean center because PCA works on uh, the, the mean of the data set has to be zero, zero. Just take my word on that one. And then PCA decomposition, uh, PCA is going to decompose X times X transpose into U, which is an orthogonal matrix, a diagonal uh, by capital lambda, right, times uh, U, U transpose. So if you've taken linear algebra, you're screaming, that's the covariance matrix. And that's just the decomposition, uh, eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. But we'll, we'll explain what that is those that don't have a, uh, that, that haven't taken linear algebra. So, but that, that's the formalism. We're from X, from the data, from the mean center data, we can generate this U, right? That gives us the best U axes to draw, the new best space to project our data to um, for us to maximize the variance on each axis. Okay. All right. Move, uh, we're going to keep going, which is, oh boy. Um, so we have this, we define that decomposition. Um, turns out, each column of U is an eigenvector of X times X transpose. And each lambda in that lambda diagonal matrix, that center term, that capital lambda, each lambda is an eigenvalue. If you don't know what an eigenvalue or an eigenvector is, this won't really make that much sense. Please cover linear algebra again. Um, I, I can't really teach you what an eigenvalue or an eigenvector is right now. Um, but uh, important, you know, if, if you know what this is, then the point is each column is an eigenvector and each lambda is an eigenvalue. In fact, for PCA specifically, uh, this is not a minus, this is a bullet point because PowerPoint formatting is done. But it sorts the eigenvalues, right? PCA specifically sorts the eigenvalue in order of magnitude. So the first column of the U matrix is the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue um, in that diagonal matrix. Okay? That sorting is important. So the interpretation is we refer to x times x transpose as the covariance matrix is we're calculating the variance of each term to itself, right? Because we're multiplying it to, its, to the transpose of itself, right? So we're measuring how, how each term varies with respect to itself. That's kind of into a general high level idea. So we're taking this covariance matrix and then deriving the eigen decomposition into this PCA solution. Um, yeah, okay, so covariance matrix. And then the first column, U. The first column of the U matrix is the direction of greatest variation. It's always it's going to be this, right? Because it's the largest eigenvalue. 
And then the second is the, the uh, direction of second greatest variation, because it's the second largest cycle size, etc. Um, yeah, so if I, uh, I, uh, lambda sub 1 is the total variation along u1, where u1 is the eigenvector lambda 1. Lambda sub 1 is the eigenvector. So I'm going to say this in one in three bullet points, that, and that's all you need to understand, right? If, especially if you don't have a linear algebra background. The covariance matrix measures how each variable is associated with one another, right? Because it's multiplying it by itself. The direction of the spread of our data, the direction of the spread of our data is the eigenvector, right? And then the relative importance of each direction is in the eigenvalues, right? So as long as you know that, that's all you need to know uh, in, in terms of PCA uh, and eigen decomposition. Obviously, you can actually go into the LEN algebra and learn what those things are if you're not already familiar, because I know we have a lot of different students with different backgrounds. Okay. Right, okay, so the first column, so we keep talking about this first column. Again, this first column defines the direction of highest variance, right? Um, and we can also redefine this as minimizing the square loss of the reconstruction, right? So we talked about how we can take this original data, right, squeeze it down using the first column of view, and then we can project it back using that same, using the same, uh, transpose of the same uh, vector, right? So if we're talking about this in like an optimization kind of a way, which is interesting. We're trying to find some direction that minimizes the loss after you go through this process, right? Between this original data and then the projected and inverted data. Okay. We're, we're trying to lose the least amount of information after going through this process, right? So in an optimization. I'm not gonna prove that, but here's the proof. If you wanna look at the slides later and look at how um, the uh, the u sub one, the first column of the u matrix found by PCA. If you want, to, if you want the proof that that is indeed the same direction that minimizes the loss after reprojection, there's the proof. I, I'm not going to go through that. Okay. All right. Okay. So, continuing on this line of thought, again, we're trying to find the direction that minimizes the residual square root norm. Again, it's the same thing that I mentioned. Trying to find the direction. We're trying to find the direction of the axis on which, if I project and then bring it back, there's a minimum loss. Okay? And then so on for another one, so on for another one. Um, also worth mentioning that all the vectors are orthogonal. Is that true? I think that's that sounds true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So solving PCA, you can do this with an iterative algorithm. I'm not sure why, uh, because we have like decomposition methods. But if you wanted to do this um, iteratively, given some data um, for each dimension, you would solve this. We're, we're now phrasing PCA in an ENM algorithm, uh, just to show that it can't be done. Right? You wouldn't really do this because you can just take the eigen decomposition of the uh, covariance. But if you wanted to come up with PCA with an ENM algorithm, where we solve for minimizing, we're minimizing the axis directions, we're finding the axis directions that minimize the information lost by projecting onto them, right? Um, and then we're updating the residual loss from that, and then we're going back and doing that again. Okay? So, so, so the point is that we can phrase, we can uh, frame PCA in an ENM algorithm if we wanted to, just to show that we can, because that's computer science for you. All right. Um, okay, I've, I mentioned this already, I, I kind of got ahead of myself, but again, um, some property of PCA. The first k columns of U are guaranteed to be the, guaranteed to be the k dimensional subspace, subspace that captures the most variability of x. That just means if I take U, I take the first k columns, the subspace defined by those first few columns is guaranteed to be the best k dimensional subspace to capture the most variance. So there is no better, there is no better k-dimensional subspace that can capture the most variance than the one found by PCA. We're just guaranteeing that the PCA is the best. Okay. Um, and we just proved k equals one in a previous uh, thing. This when we uh, framed PCA as an optimization task, and then 
proof that for k equals one. So just do that for k equals two, and so on. Okay, so to explicitly define the dimensionality, dimensionality reduction that we do with PCA, you solve PCA, you find U. You can currently just call SK learn, right? PCA. Um, and then we use the first k columns to define a k-dimensionality representation, and then that gives us a summary of the original data set. So a lot of times when we had you know, 100 dimensional, 200 dimensional data sets, this is one of the first things we do. Get them down into two dimensional or three dimensions and then plot it, right? Just do a scatter plot of the two dimensional or three dimensional PCA dimensionality reduction. And Sometimes there's like very obvious clusters, in which case you locked out, and in other cases it's a total blob, and like now we actually have to do work, right? But if you if you can PCA that to two dimensions, and there's clear clusters, like boom, then you're done, right? Just run clustering on that, uh, then you're good to go. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is an example. This is a this is a really uh, this is a really good example, I think, because this kind of visualizes this kind of abstract concept of two-dimensional space. So this is called eigenfaces. So what we do is we take a corpus of faces, we take a um, list of images of faces, and we treat each pixel as a feature. And then we run PCA, and what we can do is we can actually visualize the eigenvectors that we get. Okay? So this is an eigenface. So it's saying that using these eigenfaces, using some linear combination of these eigenspaces, we can build eventually every face that was in the data. Um, so I think this is an example of starting from like the mean and then like slowly reconstructing up to like someone else's face. Um, but again, if we, if we, uh, we, and we can do this by we take someone's face, right? We project it into k dimensions, right? So 15 or 10, it's originally like 300,000 because it's an image, right? So we can project it down into less dimensions, right? And then we project it back into image space. What we can end up at. Um, so we did this. So Yisong did this with previous years of CS155, um, where we have your images um, from like your directory. So this is like an average space that Yisong calculated um, from like four or five years of, of this course. And then these are the eigenfaces that you can get from of that, right? So again, the colors here don't even mean anything because uh, once you get into eigenspace, like the values are negative and positive and flows. This is just the kind of color map representation of these spaces. But the concept is, with this average space, because it's uh, we need to mean subtract the data, right? And then with all, each of these eigenfaces, if you have enough eigenspace, eigenfaces, we can take some linear combination to reconstruct every face that was in the original data set. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good question. So the number of, um, you have as many eigenvectors as you have like number of features, right? But we're just keeping like five or like ten. Um, but and th this is like the top eigenface at the top there. It's like the most important direction, right? And then so on and so forth. So it's like the top twelve eigenfaces from, from that data set. Okay. And then from there, you know, you can do this. This is a, a previous student who's graduated, so we're allowed to use their image. Um, so again, if we take, uh, if we try to project this into the eigen, uh, project this using just five eigenfaces and then reconstruct, that's what it looks like. We use 10, 15, 20, 30. The more and more eigenfaces we use, the more variance in the original data we can keep, right? That's the concept here, right? So um, that's the amount of information we keep. We take like the 300,000 dimensional data and then we compress it down to five. Which is kind of impressive if you kind of think about it. Like five dimensions and that's what you get. Or like maybe 30 dimensions compared to like 300,000 here, right? Just 30 faces linearly combined gives you that compared to like the original input. That's kind of impressive. All right, so I did it for this year. Ooh, I did this last night at like 4 a.m. All right, so. <laughs> Let me pull up the. We don't have that much time, so maybe we have time for one or two examples. Um, let's start the kernel. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. 
I don't know how to get rid of that. Hold on. There you go. So I took the all of her directory photos from the website, from the registrar, because I have that power. Uh, um, and then I did I did do one thing that Isam didn't do, which is um, I normalized for all the face locations. So when you do this, it's kind of important that the face is in the same place, because when you take the average, like if, if your face is everywhere, then it's not going to be it's not going to be right. So I took this. This is running on my laptop, so this will take a second. Um, it shouldn't take that long to import NumPy. Right? I hate live demos. This is always what happens. There we go. All right, well, the data. Right, so now this is the face normalization, so I use the um, hard cascade. Someone asked me about face detection without deep learning at some point. This is how you do it. This is a um, cascade classifier, a hard cascade, where someone has gone in and defined what a face looks like already. So this is the mean face. Whoops, oh no, don't jump ahead. That link me lead up, okay. So there's a mean face. So it looks more like a face because I normalized for all the eye locations. So I'm pretty happy about that. So th th this is for this year only. This is for just for 2023. Um, okay, and then if we do this, these are the top 12 eigenfaces um, from that data set, right? So from the 189 images that I had. Um, you'll notice that some of this is handling the variance of the background, right? So some, some photos have a blue background. And so eigenfaces need to kind of cover that variance as well. So um, you'll see that. Okay. Does anyone want to volunteer their face? I'm serious. Sure. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Can you find your name on this directory? It's uh, last name. Page four, row two, column four. So what this is doing, we're, we're using different number of components to reconstruct the profile picture. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> My math didn't work. Anyways, all right, well, that's just, this is random, I guess. Oh, no, page, no, page three, page four. Two. All right. Anyways, this is someone random, but I'll block it out in the recording. Anyways, so you can see, um, you can see that you know, uh, using just one eigenface, right? We already get. Um, if you remember the mean image, right? It's kind of like a generic androgynous face, right? But even with one eigenface, we can get kind of a gender representation, almost, right? With a, at least a hair representation, right? And then as you use more eigenfaces, right, it um, gets closer and closer to reconstruction until you end up um, at the original input, which is on the right here. I don't know why that didn't work. I spent so much time on making sure the columns are right. Um, I don't even see that image on my roster. Okay. Oh, there's some skip, all right. Anyways, there's bugs, always, <laughs> live demos. Anyway, so this is, this is the concept. We're doing this randomly anyway, so now I'm just gonna pick random numbers. It's not going to be in the recording. I'm going to block out the screen in the recording. And everyone will be sorry that they missed the demo. Um, there we go. There's another one, right? So we have the mean face. And this one's kind of interesting because the uh, face position is a little different. But you can almost see it morphing as we do more and more linear combinations of the eigenface. Okay. Was this interesting? Was this worth doing at like 4 a.m.? All right, cool. Yeah? Why is there not taking linear combinations inside of the different values? Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So it's literal. So each, you can treat each of these faces as eigenvectors. And then you multiply that. Um, so, so, so those become the columns, right? And so you can kind of think of it as 
when you multiply the input by those columns, we're projecting that input image into the space defined by those columns, and then we're projecting it back into the input space. So it's a, it's a linear, it's a combination, I shouldn't say linear combination, it's a combination of these eigenfaces, but kind of conceptually you can think of it as we're stacking them on top of each other with some weights, right? And then they add up to be, that's like a kind of naive intuitive way of thinking about it. But it's each each of these faces defines some axis in the like three hundred thousand dimensional space of the pixel lattice. Right. Wow, just grayscale. No, this, these are like um, these aren't grayscale. This is RGB. Oh. Um, but in eigen, this is an eigenvector, and so the RGB values don't mean anything anymore. So I did have to scale this to like min max. So the colors aren't real here. It's it's kind of fake color. It's pseudo color. Can you use that to create a face that doesn't exist in the data set? Uh, can you cr use that to create? Uh, if you had, um, if you could define a face in the latent space, so in the space that these eigenfaces define, if you could go in and put in numbers, yeah, it would give you something bad. I don't know if you would if it would give back something good, because these eigenvectors don't have any like semantic meaning. It's literally just looking at RGB values. So you somehow, have, it, it'd be hard. Theoretically, it's possible. It'd be hard with this representation. There's other ways, like in deep learning methods, where this embedding is more semantically meaningful. So sometimes, there are ways to do this where, and we'll talk about this, where each vector, like each axis, defines like nose shape, and like skin color, and like face structure, and like things like that. In that sense, you could shift those numbers around, and it would actually generate at you. But this particular example with PCA, it's too kind of uh, locked in to the individual pixel values to truly do that. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah, this is fine. Um, I would upload this, but again, it's like privacy stuff, so I'm not going to. But if you want to come up and like play around with it and try and get your photo on there, like, we're welcome to come up to it for your Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Okay, so we have one last concept to cover, which is singular value decomposition. So again, if you've taken linear algebra, you're aware of this, um, where instead of taking the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix, we just operate on the input matrix X directly, and then we can decompose that down to an orthogonal U, right, an orthogonal U, some diagonal um, matrix, and then some orthogonal matrix um, at the end here. So uh, again, if you haven't run into this in linear algebra before, don't worry about it. If you want to learn it, because Catch up on linear algebra, uh, linear algebra do so. And I'm just trying to draw a uh, comparison between PCA and SVD here because they're a very relevant uh, subject. In fact, SVD and PCA is equivalent because PCA is just working on the covariance space. If you break it apart um, into the SVD decomposition, you just end up with the same thing back again. Okay. Um, and then here, um, uh, Yisong goes over kind of how he did eigenfaces using SVD. I did eigenfaces using PCA, so this isn't really quite relevant, but if you were to do it with um, uh, SVD, you would do the decomposition down to uh, U sigma V, um, and then he did this thing where he like took uh, square root of the diagonal matrix and like put it into U and V. I don't know if that's like legit, but it seems to work, so <laughs> I don't know like the theoretical basis behind this, because I, I didn't do this right. Um, this is how he did eigenfaces. Um, but just know that one way to do that, you can, you can do this similar process with SVD as well as, as PCA. That's just the point that we're trying to make. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, I thought he was doing some kind of like interpolation, but I, I don't think so. Because that definitely wouldn't work for this. Um, but yeah, I think this is just a. Uh, I, I, Okay, so again, like I mentioned, a uh, good question, by the way, um, the limitation eigenfaces is that each dimension is a pixel, which doesn't mean anything. Um, semantically, we would prefer our embedding to be you know, uh, semantically meaningful, it's a segue for a future lecture. Um, but if a dimension had more meaning, you know, uh, we'd have a much clearer visualization. Okay. All right, in summary, um, clustering in PCA, 
are two unsupervised methods that reduce the dimensionality of data representation in one way or the other. Clustering does this by um, defining the dimensionality as cluster membership, whereas PCNSCD actually um, finds the best axes um, that explain the most variance about the data, and then we can throw away some of those axes, right? And we can trust that the remaining axes characterize um, as much as possible about the variance of the original data set using those less axes, right? Using those less dimensions. Um, coefficients, yeah, and k-dimensional projection. Um, and then this kind of allows us down the line to do nice visualizations and nice interpretations. And again, clustering and PCA are some of the first things we do um, in data science and machine learning where we need to understand our data before we even start labeling it, right? Uh, because maybe labels aren't required, or maybe there are structures, or maybe there are anomalies, right? Uh, dimension uh, analogy reduction is really good at uh, doing anomaly. In fact, there's an anomaly detection method where we train, uh, we fit PCA on normal data, and then if abnormal data comes in, the reconstruction is really bad because the PCA hasn't expected anomaly in the anomalous data. So you can do anomaly detection with this. Um, my previous project called DEMA kind of used this concept to do um, anomaly detection and like discovery, content discovery in large data sets. This is a huge field, right? It's not just this. There's a lot of um, additional things you can do to um, improve on these methods um, and help them be like actually useful. Um, and then again, uh, it helps us with generating nice visualizations and for that initial step, you'll often hear it being called exploratory data analysis, right? Where given some data set, you're just messing with it to see what's what's in it, what are the correlations, what are the clusters, what are the dimensions, right? Um, Etc. Okay, so next lecture um, is on Thursday. It'll be on interpretability and explainability, uh, again by Dr. Lucas Manfred. I know it's midterms, but if you come and just work on your midterm in class, I don't care nor does Dr. Lucas Mandrake. Right? Um, it's just that he's a pretty good speaker and it's kind of a shame to see him through the screen. So if you have a chance to come or maybe take a break from midterms or assignments or you guys are like totally stressed out by like way too much work all the time, I get it, but um, if you can come and, um, and uh, talk to, uh, listen to Dr. Lucas Mandrake, right? I would really appreciate it. And if there's time left over, because I don't know how long of a presentation he can do, I'll just do office hours afterwards anyway. Um, I do have office hours after class today for one hour in Annenberg. We can walk over. Same thing on Thursday and then Friday morning. Okay? All right. Thanks, everyone.